This is where we live. An earth which is populated with over five billion people. Different races, religious beliefs, conflicting ideologies. Some violently antagonistic to each other. It is a world in constant conflict. An earth where over 100 million people have died because of the emergence of one ideology. It is a world that's turning red. Since the end of World War II, America has been submerged in two bloody conflicts at the cost of over 100,000 American lives. It has been a strange war with sanctuaries for the enemy, borders we could not cross. It has been called a Cold War even when warm American blood was being shed. It is a war unlike any other battle in which the United States has been engaged. It's the most deadly conflict in this nation's history. Why? Because it's a war not restricted to battlefields. Its weapons are propaganda, subversion, disinformation, and psychological warfare. It is a war to manipulate the minds of men. It's a conflict of which many Americans are totally unaware. A handful, only a handful of American politicians understand it or know how to combat it. It is a war we are losing to an aggressive, persistent, and devious enemy. The result of this war will either be a communist world or a world without communism. It will be one or the other. Marxist leaders believe they will be an unstoppable force by the late 1990s. They are convinced that the balance of power is swinging so dramatically to their side that their victory will be assured. They are confident to the point of arrogance. There is ample reason for their confidence. Why shouldn't they be? The communists have a solid influence over 1.8 billion people, 36% of the world's population. They control over one-third of the land surface of the world. Since 1917, an average of 70,000 people a day have been forced to live under Marxist-Leninist rule. Communist advancement has been solid and at the present time is accelerating. They have acquired military bases worldwide, have agents working in every country, and with minor exceptions can point to net gains everywhere for the last 40 years. Over 100 million people have been systematically and ruthlessly exterminated, a number almost equal to half the population of the United States. An alarming fact is that Western powers seem to be unable to curb Marxist-Leninist expansionism or even take corrective measures to combat it. The question then is, why are we losing? Communism certainly isn't a better system of government, it has never produced sufficient goods and services for its people. It isn't a free society, and the individual citizen is subservient to the state. How then has it succeeded in gaining such an impact on the world? The former director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, J. Edgar Hoover, called them masters of deceit, and they are. But more so, they are a dedicated cadre of well-trained activists, knowledgeable and sophisticated techniques of propaganda, communication, and the effective use of subversion, which has revolutionized contemporary warfare. No longer is combat the only way to soften and conquer an enemy. We now see turmoil instigated through agitation and propaganda, setting the stage for revolution and conquest. Ignorance of this methodology invites destruction. Over 2,500 years ago, Sun Tzu wrote, He who lacks foresight and underestimates his enemy will surely be captured by him. Also, Sun Tzu asks, Do we know our enemies and do we know ourselves well enough to make comparisons? What do we really know about communists? Are they our enemy? Well, the answer is yes. Why? Because communists believe America is their enemy. And as anyone knows, it doesn't take two to make a war. War needs only to exist in the minds of one, and the other is engaged in war, whether he likes it or not. Communists to a man believe the war exists. Simply stated, 
It is Karl Marx's view of mankind in conflict, a universal class warfare, worldwide antagonism between the wage earner and the property owner, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. Marx perceived the bourgeoisie as the property people, land barons, and the owners of the means of production. The proletariat were the workers, the oppressed. Marx saw the war between the two classes as perpetual. The Communist Party was created to end the hostilities in favor of the proletariat. Marx didn't declare the war, he merely discovered it. With capitalism established throughout the world, the struggle has always been international in scope. America, the ultimate imperialist state, is obviously the ultimate enemy. Marxist-Leninist everywhere are at war with the United States of America, whether we like it or not. It is Lenin's plan that the communist responsibility centers on resolving the war in total, unconditional victory. Coexistence with capitalist America is unthinkable and totally out of step with Marxist-Leninist doctrine. To understand Marxist-Leninist thought is to comprehend scientific dialectical materialism. That's the doctrine that every communist follows. And if one knows nothing about scientific dialectical materialism, one knows next to nothing about the communist movement and how it operates. The authors of communist philosophy were Karl Marx and Nikolai Lenin. From the minds of these two, Marxist-Leninism was born and the doctrine of dialectical materialism was promulgated. It is a method of logic based upon contradictory opposites. Dialectical materialism is taught in every communist school in the world. All actions are derived from dialectical perspectives. Dialectic progress is progress in the face of opposition or opposed progress. And uh, a simple example is imagine a person leaving a crowded hall. He doesn't just walk straight towards the door, uh, pushing everyone out of the way. But uh, when he comes to a group, then he retreats and uh, goes round it or uh, moves in a different direction. But he's always got the objective of uh, reaching the door, uh, though his direction at specific times uh, can be away from the door and not towards it. Another example is driving in a nail with a hammer. It's a rather foolish man who brings the hammer crashing down and keeps on pushing. When that blow has spent itself, he reverses the hammer, withdraws it. An individual who does not understand the process, observing this, might say he's given up, he's forsaken the objective. But one who understands the process knows that the withdrawal of the hammer is as essential to the advancing of the nail as the downward thrust. In other words, the backward movement is equally as important as the forward movement. Exactly. The communists often approach their goal by going away from it, as Lenin stated and Stalin emphasized and every communist leader uh, applies. We've learned how to advance. We must also learn how to retreat. We see dialectics at work when communist aggression is followed by peace talks and conciliatory action, conquest by terror and violence, and then detente. Witnessing the backward swing of the Soviet political hammer, many Americans are swayed into believing the communists are sincere in their publicized desires for peace. They do make concessions, but only until their opposition is lulled into a false sense of security, even if it takes years. Patience is one of the communists' most reliable weapons. The world will see a new communist leader emerge and hope a change in attitude is taking place. Then, fighting suddenly breaks out on a new front. Remember, the Gorbachev who talks of peace is the same Gorbachev who controls the fighting in Afghanistan, supplies terrorists in Africa, and ships arms to the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Soviet leaders come to power because their strict adherence to Marxist-Leninism. Gorbachev is the epitome of the Marxist-Leninist man. His rise to the top was his reward for being a dedicated cadre member, well-versed in dialectics.